I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. On today's episode, I speak with Marlon Spike, CEO and founder, about his work in the venture capital industry and how venture capital and technology, respectively, can help the United States meet its geopolitical objectives. We also discussed the role of SpaceX and public-private partnerships in meeting America's dual-use security needs. You know, John Paul Jones, father of the American Navy, he said, men mean more than guns in the rating of a ship. So having that human element element in all of our decision-making processes in the battlefield or on Capitol Hill is hugely important. He also said, he who will not, he who will not risk will not win. So that to me signals that the government needs to take risk. We need to take risk because we don't know which programs are gonna be successful. We don't know which technologies are gonna be necessary for a particular fight or a particular conflict. And hopefully that conflict never happens, but we need to be ready. And that risk component, I think that drags in the private sector to share in the risk and also share in the reward. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Neil Keegan, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Thanks, Marshall. Great to be here. Great to chat with you. So you are a venture capitalist. You work at Marlin Spike. Before we get into your background and Marlin Spike, I'd love to kind of do a VC exercise, which is if I were a founder pitching you on something like a podcast per se, maybe, I would come to you with a slide deck. It's just a useful intellectual exercise. And one of my favorite slides on a slide deck is the problem slide. It's looking at um, it's explaining like what's a problem that your company, your effort, et cetera, is solving. So as a venture capitalist, if you're thinking about defense technology, America's geopolitical situation, et cetera, how would you define the problem that we're going to kind of go about through this conversation attempting to solve? Great. Well, that's an excellent place to start. I think the the problem is that our defense industrial base is woefully inadequate. And frankly, it's really even bigger than that. It's our industrial base is woefully inadequate. And I, and I think there's a real need to have a effectively a, a new Freedom's Forge, call it 2.0. For those of you uh, that have read the book, Freedom's Forge, it, it chronicles what happened in the late 30s when uh, President Roosevelt got together uh, some of the leading private market commercial leaders of industry. And they recognized that we had a major problem, that we were not ready for a global conflict. And I, I feel like we're in that same place again. Um, you know, part of the uh, the rationale behind we're not ready and we're, our, our industrial base is inadequate is that the rising threats we see across the globe are are very serious. And I, you know, our personal view, and I, and I think it's um, borne out by fact and a lot of the great research that, that Hudson has done is that it's really backed by you know, one large state actor, and that's China. And we can certainly go into a little bit more on that and where that's going to be driving um, you know, a lot of the problems and hopefully uh, the need for certain solutions that I think venture capital can step in and be part of that solution along with our, our partners in the government, in the, uh, in the Defense Department, and the intelligence community. Given the way you define the problem, and I 100% agree with that description of it, to what degree do you see as an investor technology specifically as being part of what helps us solve this problem? In the sense that one could imagine a world where in the 1990s we didn't deindustrialize, and that could be an environment where maybe we'd be a better, in a better state from a geopolitical perspective, even if we hadn't invested in the newest technologies or different factories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, where is the X factor that technology brings to the table coming in here? Sure. Well, why don't we start with an example, and we'll just pick the Navy and shipbuilding. So, um, as you'd mentioned in the uh, the opening part of the podcast, I'm a Navy veteran, and so the Navy is near and dear to my heart. Um, there was a recent article that highlights the shipbuilding inadequacies uh, of the United States vis-a-vis China. So right now, the industrial shipbuilding capability is 233 times or greater to one with uh, to China's favor. So this is this is an awful statistic, and it you know breaks my heart being an ex-Navy man. But 
your question really is, you know, how do we fill that gap? I mean, the lead, they're so far ahead. I mean, it, it could take years and we might never, ever catch up in traditional shipbuilding capabilities if we're realistic, unless we're willing to do something meaningful, like double or triple the size of the defense budget and allocate the necessary resources towards, you know, going back to the days of Secretary Lehman under President Reagan, you know, the 600 ship Navy, because numbers do matter. However, the capability gaps that can fill in around the edges, and, and I think we're on the right track here in, in noticing that we need more, um, we need more mass autonomous and attributable systems. And particularly in Navy, this can be extremely helpful in, in broadening our capability set. Uh, just think about a potential conflict in the Pacific where we can have aerial drones, surface drones, and subsurface drones that are low cost, scalable, uh, and really attributable, meaning if we lose them, it's not a big deal because they're unmanned and they're low cost. So that can be a force amplifier and can help augment some of the challenges we have around not having the actual physical number of capital ships to go head to head with uh, with an adversary over there. This question speaks to your background. I'm really curious, as a Navy veteran yourself, I think your approach to defense investing would probably be a little frustrating in some senses because I feel as if at a deep level, you would say the biggest problem we need to solve is we need to rebuild our ability to build capital ships, to build the Merchant Marine, all of those Freedoms Forge 1.0 ways that the U.S. dominated in World War II for production capacity. But there isn't exactly like a venture firm or a company saying, hey, like we're going to do that. Like there isn't like a company that's saying, hey, new Liberty ships, we are going to use technology to like make it so that we can build all of these new ships and build the Navy, build new Jeep carriers. So effectively, that's not exactly the actual offer here. So just from your personal experience, what is the gap between the problems that sailors, Marines, airmen, soldiers, et cetera, are facing and the actual technologies that you're investing in and the solutions that you're providing? Sure. So it's, it's a it's a great point and a great starting point. I think the the big issue, particularly for our, our men and women that are serving across the service, is that you know they really are spread too thin. So just going back to the Navy example, if you have a fewer amount of ships, but those ships are tasked to do the same things, even even normal things like diplomatic port visits, which are very important for the U.S. Navy and for our country, because that's really a projection of power ashore. Because in presence matters. If you don't have enough ships, you're, you're the operational tempo or the op tempo of those ships going to all these different ports is very, very high. And if you're not meeting your recruiting goals also, you have fewer number of people on fewer number of ships, which increases potential cause for, for casualties, both on the military side and the civilian side, and might increase the the opportunity for for a risk of conflict as well. So that's that's a big problem. Um, you know, the other the other point I wanted to make is that. It, it's not the mission of the venture capital industry to to back and um, invest in shipbuilders, for example. I mean, that that is the mission set for the country, to provide for the common defense. That's the use of the taxpayer money, and we need to have the will and the capability combined to make sure that happens. Where I see the venture community, particular in this defense technology world, is to obviously understand the problem and then look for those gaps where technology can fill in and then find these bold founders that come up with these amazing ideas that can move at speed to fill these capability gaps and then hopefully get help from the government, whether it's a signaling from the DOD or the intelligence community, like we need these capabilities or a recognition from that group when a capability is developed with private capital that can be used for a, a certain situation, then the DOD says, great, we're, we're a buyer and we're a buyer at scale. Uh, and then the last piece, you know, when we look at investing in these types of companies, we're always looking at it from a dual use perspective because you know our number one job is to produce a return for our investors. And so we believe that you know if you take a great company and they're starting out and we really call them defense forward companies, um, as long as what it, whatever it is that they're creating, the product, the service, as it might initially start in the DOD or the intelligence community, but we want to be able to envision a world uh, where their capabilities can then be applied to the commercial markets because we think that really gives it the um, the velocity and then ultimately the, the highest returns. So classic examples of dual use technologies from World War II and the Cold War would be radar, the jet engine, the internet itself. Like, what are some examples of 
military forward technologies that you've come across that you're kind of excited about? Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but there's a world where we could envision this changing our lives. Great. Yeah. And you bring up a great, a great point. Not a lot of folks know that this history of dual use investing. So these innovations that were led out of military or intelligence community needs, this goes back to, you know, over, you know, almost a hundred years ago. I mean, the whole space industry, for example, where would we be without satellites and GPS um, or even the launch industry? And I think, you know, SpaceX and, and Elon Musk has really shown us the way in terms of a, a public and private partnership to some degree, because it's a, frankly, it's a symbiotic relationship. There would be no SpaceX if you didn't have a bold founder doing something incredibly courageous and e extremely difficult, but without government contracts and that demand signal, um, there'd be no way he could bring these launch costs down and then then succeed at the, the level of success that they've had. So it's, it's, it's very important to, to focus on that. Yeah, something I'm curious about, because I think you set this up well when you explained that, you know, VCs, defense tech, which is a small portion of all of the overall um, venture capital in this country and the broader world, are a part of a broader ecosystem, civilian, military, otherwise, that is filling in various aspects of the national defense. So I think if you're explaining this ecosystem, really go into your background and help us like understand like what, I mean, we kind of know what venture capital is here, obviously, but what is venture capital? Like, what was the background that led you to that position? And how does Marlin Spike itself kind of culminate all of that in a way that fits into this broader picture of a national defense we're talking about? Sure. So my, my path has been a little circuitous than, than a typical, you know, VC. So, you know, obviously started out, I uh, was a Naval Academy uh, midshipman, served six years in the Navy on, on ships, uh, was fortunate that I was stationed uh, all over the world. Um, always had an interest in, in economics and finance. So after graduate school here in DC at Johns Hopkins Sice, um, I was fortunate enough to get an internship at Goldman Sachs. So went there for a summer uh, on the equity side of the business, worked in New York for a number of years, wanted to be closer to the investment side of the business and, and the client side of the business, having worked with some of our hedge funds in New York, moved to Los Angeles, also the weather was better. Uh, <laughs> And then started working with our private clients. Uh, one of my clients sold their business. I went over to work with him during the financial crisis, and that ultimately turned into uh, establishing a family office and running the investment portfolio. So we had a, uh, a big focus on alternative investments, so private equity, venture capital, um, real estate, and outside of investing in funds, which was always of interest to me, but we also did direct deals. And so going back to your earlier question uh, about innovations in interesting companies. SpaceX was an early investment that we did about 10 years ago. And I think that's when the light bulb really went off for me in terms of mixing my my passion for history and service and national security with, wow, this is fascinating from a technological standpoint, but also super interesting from an investment standpoint, where finding these companies that are truly potentially changing the world and changing whole industries and upending them with disruptive you know, founders, but also from an investment perspective, if you could find a way to solve these problems for national security, get early revenues, get early proof of concept, um, get non-dilutive capital from an investor standpoint, that really provides a level of, of risk mitigation. And then as these companies continue to progress and then scale into the commercial markets, that gives a whole other level of upside. So I liked that return profile mm -hmm. of investing. So the, the seed was planted to focus in that area. And then a number of years went on and I was just more and more interested in being entrepreneurial and starting starting a fund and working with like-minded partners. So I, I left um, the family office about five years ago and moved from LA back to DC. And really with the expressed intent of, of starting Marlin Spike so we could invest in this area. And I started doing, you know, one-off one -off deals, you know, S special purpose vehicles. Uh, Palantir was our, was our first investment uh, during the middle of COVID, which was a great success. And what was great about that, not only was it a great, you know, financial success, but a an absolutely spectacular company. And I, I loved your pod with Sean the other day as well. Um, terrific company, really doing some amazing things. 20 years in the making too, right? Mm -hmm. So what we were seeing is that there's a whole universe of these unbelievable companies that are starting now or have started recently that are even operating faster and at at speed and iterating. And there was, you know, capital for that. So as we did more and more deals, I kept running into some really great people in this space in DC, which 
which gave me the confidence to then partner up and put together Marlin Spike as a dedicated fund, which is a whole nother business in and of itself versus sen- trying to say, hey, I've got this investment in Palantir, you should invest in it. It's now it's, here's our thesis, here's our strategy, here's our team, here's how we find these companies, here's where we invest in them in the life cycle of their company, here's how we plan to help them grow with our with our network, and here's how we ultimately are gonna, we see them exiting so we can provide a great return, and then, oh, by the way, go out and raise more, more capital, raise a subsequent fund, and do it all over again so we can make even more of an impact and invest in more companies. Something I am uh, curious about, you said semi uh, disparagingly about yourself in a nice way, um, that you had a non-traditional background for an investor, but you know we're talking about defense tech specifically. And folks who don't follow the venture world may have missed this point. This is a relatively new category. So it's not like with, let's say, traditional venture investing where people have been doing some version of this since the 1970s. Um, if Palantir is the first modern defense company, like the actual number of people who have founded top tier defense companies, because typically you could think of a big figure of market entry since 16 z Netscape, AOL, a bunch of different companies, then he launches a VC firm, that's a logical path for him. But given the fact that that set of opportunities isn't quite available in the defense tech category. What do you think makes a good, I've actually, I've never asked this, but I kind of wonder what makes a good defense tech founder? So I think that that opens up the the landscape, which, and which I think is great. I think, you know, if you had asked that question four years ago, there wouldn't really be that many folks you could, you could talk about. Cause there are some, as you've mentioned, some very skilled and excellent investors that have run, you know, massively successful um, VC funds like Founders Fund, or uh, you know, obviously Peter Thiel or Joe Lonsdale at, at Eight VC that have that were investors in Palantir, for example. Um, but in terms of a a pure play defense tech or dual use focused fund, there there really, to my knowledge, there weren't many or any a, a number of years ago. And now there are actually quite a lot, and they run the gamut from smaller funds with maybe one or two people, and maybe they had a intelligence background or, or military background and uh, you know had some background in, in finance. So they, they put together a fund uh, to other funds that have built you know pretty robust teams and, and themes around this strategy. So it's actually great to see the space um, expanding. But I think what's really important if you're if you're going to be successful in this space, I think you have to have the right team in place because mm-hmm. this is this is not a um, I don't think it's a one person act. I think it's it's too big, it's too complex, and there's just too much to do when you're running a fund and, and really being a fiduciary for your investors. So the way we set up Marlin Spike is that you know one of my partners, uh, Miss Leftalusic, he's got a very deep background as an investor in this space, going back almost 15 years. So I thought he would be a good complement to my more generalist background as, mm-hmm. as a portfolio manager and investor, and, and that's really born out because he can really go deep into the weeds uh, on these companies. And secondly, you know, a partner like Chip Walter, who was another Naval Academy grad, you know, 28 years U.S. Navy, had command, major command, was with General Petraeus over in Afghanistan, and then eight years uh, in the CIA, uh, about five and a half of which he worked very closely with InQtel. So a really deep understanding of the problem set. And then after that work with the Northrop Grumman standing up their ventures program. So it also a very deep understanding of how the primes, the prime contractors think about this mm-hmm. space. So that combination, uh, in addition to a great CFO and, and a great uh, vice president who's a West Point grad, that combination is I think pretty unique in our space. We can bring a lot of you know weapons or assets to bear in evaluating these companies. And then most importantly, after we write the check, how do we help them grow and scale? You know, something uh, I always note that you learn from having these conversations a lot and that outsiders might not be aware of is it's just not 2018 anymore in the sense that that's when, you know, obviously Project Maven and Google and the employee protests. That's not to say that Silicon Valley is like perfect on these issues now, but very clearly, um, I think a combination of, of COVID, 
um, and the emerging consensus around like great power rivalry, and then obviously Russia's invasion of Ukraine has just opened up the space for venture and tech, and even the university. I work at the University of Texas. Like UT is very comfortable. Hook yeah, hook them. Like UT is very comfortable um, speaking in this like national interest centric way. But I think wasn't quite as true broadly back in the 2010s. But that means that the space is just more crowded. Like I don't know if you were, were you at the Defense Venture Summit. Um, uh, I wasn't, but my partners were. So your partners yeah, were there. Mike, I, Mike put on a great event. Yeah, Mike, Mike Slaw, shout out to Mike Slaw. Um, someone announced 110 VCs were there, which for my part, like, that's crazy. But that's also the definition of it's not 2018. You know, people are in this space now. So what does it mean for this category to now be crowded? Especially this isn't, it's not, it's not, a, this, this isn't SaaS. I'm not saying SaaS is easy, but it just means that yeah, the number of companies is no, much it's smaller. Tricky. It, it, it is tricky, right? Because you've got companies that, um, are are SaaS related. You've got companies that are pretty purely hardware related, and then you've got a nice mix of companies that are really hardware and software um, interrelated. So you can think of a company like Andrew, which is really a software first company with their with their lattice operating system, and then they bolt on all these you know really amazing products. And it, what's great about them, and it's a good example of. Um, the private sector stepping in and taking risk with their capital and, and investor capital, if they can't create a, a product and deliver it, then they'll go out and they'll find another one and then they'll acquire the company and they'll fold it in to the platform. So it's that that type of company that that moves out and moves at speed. And I think you're seeing really the same thing with the venture community where uh, people are taking the risk to go you know, run a fund and running a fund. I mean, it's a long-term commitment. It's you're asking for 10 year money. Mm -hmm. It's hard to raise capital. You got to put your own capital in and there, there are no guarantees. So I think it's, what's great about the space is that there are a lot of folks that have taken that leap, not only to build these innovative companies, but to take the leap to go out and raise capital around this theme. And, you know, not all of them are going to survive. And I think as it, as the, as more capital and more entrants come in, I think it means you just need to be even more careful with who you choose to partner with from the investment standpoint and who you choose to invest in and at what stage, right? And so the example is, you know, you could have a company that, wow, it looks cool. It looks really sexy. Um, but, you know, a lot of deals got done in 2020 and 2021 at very inflated valuations on companies that were trading at, you know, 10, 15, 20 times forward expected revenues. And they might only ever really be a, a defense related company. Mm -hmm. And if they legitimately have zero commercial applications, the reality is those companies are going to have a hard time going all the way to an IPO, which of course is what everybody wants. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of those companies, even the ones that, and the vast majority of them aren't going to make it. The ones that do are probably going to be an acquisition target. And the most likely buyers are going to be the big primes. Mm -hmm. And the big primes, the public, they trade, you know, one and a half, maybe two times revenue. They're not going to pay 10, 15, 20 times revenue. They're just not because they're public. They're quarter to quarter. They got to do share buybacks and dividends. They got to buy something that's a creative. So if you come into a company at too high of a valuation, you're, you're going to get stuck. You're mm -hmm. never going to get out and you're not going to get the venture type of return. So there's going to be a lot of... Um, capital destruction and unhappy investors. And that's probably gonna play out over the next year and a half, two years, especially as these companies, they get to their their milestone marks where they typically raise, raise capital for 18 months or 24 mm -hmm. months. And if they raise capital in a series A or a series B at you know a, a level where they were priced to perfection, and if they're not hitting their marks, they're gonna hit reality. And the reality is a down round, or they're not going to get further funding uh, from any any kind of government partner, and it, it's going to be a long road. And marks are going to come through, and then the the capital that flooded in is going to say, "Wait a minute, I just got my teeth kicked in," and you might lose those investors for you know a generation. Yeah, and I, I'm personally really proud of how ecumenical this podcast is. So I've had founders on, I've had folks in the military, I've had policymakers, and I've had someone like you who's a, a VC. So I want folks to understand that we're kind of getting into the weeds here because like this actually matters in terms of how we've structured part of the way we actually run our, our foreign and defense policy. So last specific question about being a VC. Um, folks might not know this, but if you're not in VC, but it really matters like when you're actually investing 
in a company. Um, so when you know you go to Marlon Spike's website, as everyone should be doing after this episode or during this episode, um, you'll notice that a company you've invested in is Andoro. Um, and you didn't invest in Andoro though in 2017. In 2018, like the, the initial rounds when the company is just an idea, you're investing in the later rounds. Could you explain your philosophy around investing in later rounds and where Marlin Spike's value add is in a situation like that? Sure. Because it also should be noted, like companies like Andrew Rowe tend to have like a big founder uh, who's bringing a lot of money to the table. Uh, so uh, this yeah, is oh the, yeah. I mean, yeah, and this is the and this is this is why it's like this stuff matters, but it's really fascinating. So I think it I think it really goes back to just my background as an investor, uh, you know, what I learned at Goldman Sachs, what I learned running a family office, uh, what I learned, you know, putting my own capital out there. And I never really liked this idea of venture. Think of it like spray and pray, like let's invest in 20, 30, 40 companies. And, you know, we're going to lose 90% of them. I just, and maybe one or two really hit it and they could be, you know, huge returns. I never really liked that. And it, it might be right. And some people do it, but what, I wanted to do with Marlin Spike and what we feel good about in terms of our partnership and where we look, we wanted to build a fund that was going to be right for our investors and right for us as we risk our capital. So our portfolio construction philosophy is, is I think, somewhat unique because I haven't really seen this out mm -hmm. there with any other kind of pure, pure play defense tech fund. We're focused on, call it roughly percent, 80% in the early stage. So seed series A to some degree series B, but we wanna keep 20% back for later stage companies. And in particular in, in our world, you know, there are companies, obviously SpaceX has made it, Andrew has made it, Palantir has made it. There's others that are coming up the curve. We don't wanna miss a consequential company. And we think that, you know, in particular with Andrew, we saw them really hitting escape velocity. I mean, that was a big round, the Series E. Um, they were raising you know, $1.2, $1.3 billion. They were over oversubscribed. Um, ultimately, it was a $1.5 billion round at close to an $8 billion uh, valuation. You know, um, we, were, we had the opportunity to get to know them, to invest, and we were, we were pleased to get to know them and pleased to invest at that level because we really saw them in a way where they could – continue to accelerate, continue to achieve. And they had such a big moat and they were moving out at such speed that we thought that ultimately they would be a, a very good competitor and start displacing some of the big uh, prime contractors. Not to say that they're gonna displace them totally, mm -hmm. but they're gonna be able to eat away at market share over time. So we, we saw in them uh, a company that could be a very, very valuable company, even coming in at that $8 billion level. And then secondly, you know, for our investors, you know, that's a company that, you know, we literally get hit up every day to sell it on the secondary market. Mm -hmm. but we're not ready, nor do we want to do that because we want to hit our return objectives. I mean, we think that can be a very good return in a relatively short period of time for our investors. So that's really our, our late stage model. And that's what we did with Palantir. And um, that's what we plan to do. We want to keep that door open in our space to place capital with some clear winners that are doing unique things. And then as it relates to, to value add, I mean, we're, we're close with them and we share ideas and, um, you know, we've introduced a number of companies to them in terms of uh, potential partnerships. So, you know, we, we want to be a value added partner to even firms as big uh, as Andrew. Now on the other end, you know, we want to find companies early too yeah. and write a bigger check where we're a bigger part of their, of their round own a bigger percentage. And so, especially if there's a company that's we'll call them more defense forward. Mm -hmm. If you can get in at a 20, 30, $40 million valuation and own, call it 10% of that company. And let's say they completely execute on their, their DOD or their intelligence strategy. And maybe, maybe the off ramp is they do get bought out by two or three times revenue by a big prime. That's still a pretty good day at that company where you got in early, get sold for two, three, $400 million. That's a, that's a great return. But if they can also then scale into the commercial side, the, the return can be much higher. So we think about putting that all together in a fund where we're shooting for a risk adjusted three to four times. We're not out there saying we're going to get you know 10x our money, although we might if we catch an outlier. Mm -hmm. But we're really trying to put together the portfolio in a thoughtful risk adjusted way. Hopefully that answers the no, question. No, no, it, it does because there's a – once again, I think as you said, there's like a unique approach. I think a lot of folks, if they know this industry, as outsiders, they'll kind of think of like the – 
you know, we're in a home run metaphor. And so it's like, yeah, like all that really matters is getting the big home run and you're not quite taking um, that approach here. So something that you've done that's very critical here is you've rooted a lot of your thoughts on this industry and your work in VC around uh, SpaceX. Most of my conversations around defense tech have focused on like Palantir and have focused on Anduril. But SpaceX is interesting because I think SpaceX provides a model of something I know you have a lot of thoughts on, which are these like public-private partnerships that speak to a unique way the United States approaches defense um, and industry or even national interest questions. So like, give me the context, for, like, why, why should we think of SpaceX? Even though there are aspects of SpaceX and Starlink and Starshield that are defense-focused, why should we just think of SpaceX and the course of its first 10, 15 years as being a model for how we can address other national interest-centric problems? Got it. Well, it's 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 an awesome topic, and I don't know if you've read uh, the recent Elon book, but it's yeah. It's, I it's, actually I actually just, I actually just finished. It's it, great, so it's right? Worth, yeah. So I mean, and people will have their own opinions, but I'm you know happily a, a big fan. And what's so interesting about SpaceX is that again, this private public partnership, but it's the ability of the founder and risk capital to come in and take that first step of doing something totally innovative, totally unique. And I think it really started with. This is insane that it costs this much to launch. This is insane that we're we're basically not reusing these rockets. Like we can figure this out. And you know, it took time, but they did. I mean, they brought launch costs down by I think about two thirds. And so now with this up tempo and launch cadence, the 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 gateway to space is wide open, mm -hmm. which is which then opens up that next stage. And so, you know, one of the one of the companies that we invested in out of Fund One is a company called Voyager Space. And I'll highlight this again as this public and private partnership. So currently we've got the International Space Station, mm -hmm. which uh, I think we all know is old, it's past its useful life, it's coming down uh, before the end of the decade. We share it with Russia, I mean, that's not good. I think they even made a they made a movie about it yeah. called ISS. Uh, I want to watch it, but my kids are like I don't want to watch that. That looks boring. That's your stuff, Daddy. Um, but to the to the same effect, you know, with Voyager Space, they're building a privately owned, privately uh, contracted space station that NASA can then use. And I think what NASA has learned through their time with SpaceX is that. You know, there is a role for the private sector to play. If the private sector can do it faster and do it cheaper and more reliably and better, then we should do that. Mm -hmm. So currently, I believe that the spend on the space station is about $3 billion a year. So just using rough numbers, if NASA can get that down to $2 billion a year and then split it between two private uh, contractors like a, a Voyager Space or an Axiom or a Blue Origin, then they've diversified their risk they can still you know, execute their missions at a lower price point. And then once we're there and operating, then that space station can be used for national security purposes. It can be used for um, a lot of uh, scientific experiments. And then we're one step closer to the moon. So these things are all building blocks and they, they wouldn't happen. And these are big dollars and these are capital intensive projects. And so having that linkage with the government will then also help private the private sector to step in knowing that these are huge capex requirements because you capex and vc don't typically go well together yeah because people get concerned time delays dilution but having that government partner i think offsets a lot of that risk when i glad you actually focused on bringing down the cost of launch because that's actually why I started this episode by focusing on like, what is the problem? And, you know, it's good that we both read Walter Isaacson's Elon book, because once again, people have their Elon critiques, but I think if we're focused operation, what happened here, like you actually have to understand the story. So obviously Elon has his desire to go to Mars. There's some like, not complicated, but he has his beliefs about humanity in the future. And it's all sort of like, it's not gobbledygook, but it's like, there are a lot of people in DC, especially who don't resonate with that. But what he did so effectively though, is as part of his path, to getting to Mars, he focused on an actual problem, which was it actually costs too much money to put vehicles into space. And oh, lo and behold, it turned out there was actually a huge customer who had a huge problem with, cost, with things costing too much. Not only the actual launches, but you know they also needed there's there's no more space shuttles, so they were dependent on like Soyuz spacecraft to get into space. There, so just focusing on a problem led to a pretty straightforward path. Now where they are, where they are now too. So I just think this exercise of problem-centric focusing would be useful even in DC policy-based areas because it gets at kind of the the 
it, it gets at the fact that if you're actually focused on these areas, especially with defense, like the customer is the government, government has problems, what problems need to be solved? A hundred percent. I think that the timing is great for that. Because uh, I'd like to, as we conclude, give a little bit of optimism here. So yeah. the the replicator program might be something that you know about. I'm sure it's going to be talked about. You know, I know today you've got a, a whole session on um, um, mass autonomous attributable systems. So problem, like we talked about earlier, the Navy's way behind, shipbuilding capacity way behind. We need more autonomy, especially if we think there's going to be a threat in the Pacific. Um, uh, could be you know any time or you know by 2027. So having so imagine a company that can come in and say, I can build you, for example, a a small, affordable, scalable, fully autonomous, unmanned underwater system that can swarm meaning it can operate with other systems that can be used for defense, it can be used for sensors, it can be used for electronic warfare, it can be used for port security, it can be used for um, monitoring underwater communications cables. I mean, and if you could deliver that to the Navy for say 75 or 100 grand a pop, and then they could put in their own, um, their own payload, whatever that might be, versus going to the large primes, that same thing might cost a million dollars plus because mm-hmm. they are not geared to innovate that quickly and at that cost level. So replicator program has signaled they want to put out a billion dollars or north of it to all these low cost, affordable, mass, attributable systems undersea, on the surface, in the air. And that's a good starting point to try to get that capital out into these companies so we can then get those things to where they need to be to address the problems. To what degree do you think defense tech is going to be able to reduce the overall cost of systems and expenses, especially as we enter into a period of possible austerity? Because if you think about tech, right, why is tech great? In software, zeros and ones, it's not physical goods. It's lowered prices in some categories. But the metaphor is kind of mixed when it comes to these hard tech defense tech spaces. Yeah, I mean, the the software component is absolutely huge. And you hit it on with your last podcast. I mean, that is absolutely huge. And I think anything that we do that's hardware related is going to have some type of of software component. But we're not going to be able to get around, especially in the DOD um, atmosphere, in terms of having some element of hardware. We're just... We're, we got to have it. So it's it's just a necessary you know, fact of life. And I think you're right. Um, we need to learn to do more with less. I mean, obviously, we, we've got um, – there's cost overruns and, uh, what, $842 billion is the budget. I mean, that's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But frankly, it's – I still – personally, I don't think it's enough. But we also need to shift our spending within that. And there's – I. Th- I view a transition period over the coming years in terms of where that money is going and how successful some of these innovation programs can be so we can potentially um, you know, displace other systems that are potentially you know, way too costly. So here's how we're close. You started the podcast by answering uh, your version of the problem. I'll offer my version of the problem. I'd love to hear your response. You could close this out in any context you want. So my version of the problem, I've been asking this to more and more guests, so this isn't just your answer here. My version of the problem is that we, it really feels like we're living in 1917 um, in the sense that we see visions of this future. If it's 1917, you have the tank. It's not quite there yet, but clearly this is going to have huge implications for everything from cavalry to infantry to to mass and speed. That's Blitz, Blitzkrieg in 1939. At the same time, though, there's a stalemate on the Western Front. There are trenches. There are just these long-term problems that have actually um, affected everything of artillery, the machine gun, et cetera. Today, we see in Ukraine especially – drone technology. We see artificial intelligence on the battlefield. We see the impact of satellites. We see all these presages of how the future is also now, but also we could see this 10xing over the course of the next decade. At the same time, though, Ukrainians are being overwhelmed by just mass, one of the most ancient of realities on the battlefield. If Mm -hmm. you actually have a lot of people and you don't particularly care about their individual worth, you can just move and move and move and move until you win. So the world we face is one that both has aspects of the future, aspects of the present, but also aspects of the past. This doesn't have to be a defense technology answer, but how do you think about this problem? Because if I'm thinking from a force planning perspective, I'm thinking from a politician or a policymaker's perspective, it's hard to come up with something comprehensive to respond to all that. I can't just say, okay, 
arsenal of democracy, let's run it again right, right. to that situation because that's not quite what it is. How do you think about this dynamic? Yeah, and I love the the fact that you're such a student of history. Uh, you know, I was a history major as well, so I was going to bring it back to a little bit of history as well. Cause, so you're so on point. What's old is new, and uh, you know, General Mattis, I think, once said that you know every every war, every battle, every skirmish has already been fought. Right, it's just in a different environment. So I think we need to recognize that, and that I, I think you're right. It'd probably be a fool's game to try to plan for every potential contingency and adversary. So I think you have to go back to really a, a little bit of history. So if you think about, you know, John Paul Jones, father of the American Navy, he said, "Men mean more than guns in the rating of a ship." So having that human element element in all of our decision making processes in the battlefield or on Capitol Hill is hugely important. He also said, he who, will not, he who will not risk will not win. So that to me signals that the government needs to take risk. We need to take risk because we don't know which programs are going to be successful. We don't know which technologies are going to be necessary for a particular fight or a particular conflict. And hopefully that conflict never happens, but we need to be ready. And that risk component, I think that drags in the private sector to share in the risk and also share in the reward. Mm -hmm. So that's that's huge. And I guess the last thing, again, going back going back to the Navy piece that we started with, is um, you know, one of the first things we learned at the Naval Academy in, in uh, naval history was Alfred Thayer Mahan. So he wrote a book in 1890 called "The Influence of Sea Power." Those tenets still remain today: projection of power ash ashore, managing and protecting choke points. I mean, just think about what happened, you know, sadly last night in Baltimore. Um, it, we'll find out what really happened, but um, imagine if that was a nefarious act. I mean, shutting down one of the busiest ports in the world and, you know, harming, you know, maybe 20, 30 people. Um, that, that's a bad fact pattern. But Alfred Thayer Mahan would have said, you need to protect your ports. You need to protect your choke points. So what's old is new. And I think we just need to have a good realization of that and just keep pressing forward with with technology, with innovation, and with, with taking and sharing risks together. That is a great place to end. Neil, thank you for joining me on Arsenal thank you. of Democracy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.